You know, preachers always have this question at about a half an hour before worship. Who is going to come? <laughs> Will anybody? Good to see you all. So this morning, we're continuing the sermon series based on Douglas Adams' book, The Prostitute in the Family Tree. Now, this one's fun because the title is Jesse Helms and Jesse Jackson. <laughs> mm. Mm. What Adams is suggesting is that there is some humor and irony in the parables of Jesus that we miss often. And so he works his way through several that he thinks have particular possibilities, and one of those is the parable of the leaven. And it's, it's really short. It's only one verse long. Jesus also said, this is Matthew 13, by the way. Jesus also said, the kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a woman mixes a little yeast into three big batches of flour. Finally, all the dough rises. <laughs> well, that's an easy one, isn't it? So the kingdom of God is like a little bit of yeast that can cause the growth of a lot of dough, right? Well, Adams points out some kind of interesting things, beginning with, to a Jew of that time, leaven was the symbol for sin and pollution. Before the Seder, every year, Jews still go all the way through their houses trying to get rid of anything that might contain any leaven because that's the symbol for sin. Now, wait just a second. So the kingdom of God is like a woman who leavens a lot of bread. You know, the calculation is that this woman just yeasted 50 pounds of dough. What is that about? Why would you use yeast to make more dough than you could bake in a day or maybe even a week? And then you get to the fact that this is a woman. The star of this parable is a woman. Women were, of course, the symbol of everything that was wrong with humanity. It was, it was the fault of females that we had kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And for that reason, women were not allowed into the worship, into the temple. Huh. So what we have now is... A disenfranchised person who uses the symbol of pollution to make more of something than could be used. What is this parable about? What does it say about the kingdom of God? Huh. What an odd and unpredictable thing. The kingdom of God must be. Adams says that the message of the parable is scandal. It's just beyond reason. It doesn't make any sense. It's like saying to your conservative friends, and Jesse Jackson was just elected to be president, or to your liberal friends, and Jesse Helms, some of us remember Jesse Helms. And Jesse Helms was just elected. It's the symbol of scandal and outrageousness. The kingdom of God is like something that's truly, truly outrageous. And then there's the parable of the mustard seed. Do you, do you know that one too? The kingdom of God's like a mustard seed. Hmm. Well, first of all, the mustard seed grows up to be a bush, not a tree. Back in the uh, 1940s and 50s, the Missouri Department of Conversation, uh, 
conservation. Why can't that word, where did that word go? <laughs> the MBC decided that they had found the solution to the problem of soil erosion. And so they offered multi-floral rows to everyone who would plant it. And then they found out that multi-floral rose is actually the Missouri version of kudzu. <laughs> it grew and grew faster and further than anybody could keep up with, and it became a pest. It became obnoxious. Hmm. That, you see, is the mustard plant. The mustard plant was hated by the Jews of the day, in part because they couldn't control it, and in part because it was famous for attracting the birds that would eat the seeds that they just planted. Mmm. Mmm. Adam suggests that perhaps Dom Crossan is correct. Oh, by the way, we got any Dom Crossan fans here? All four of his books, great biggest books, are available this weekend only from Harper Publishers for $3.99 each, an electronic version. Uh -huh. Well, Crossan suggests that maybe what Jesus is doing is maybe making a parable of what the Jews refer to as the parable of the cedars. Now, cedar trees aren't the biggest trees in our world. But to the Jews of the day, they were a lot like redwoods or sequoias, huge trees that were symbols of strength, and power. And it's especially found in Ezekiel, which is not a book we spend a lot of time in. <laughs> Ezekiel likened the Egyptian pharaoh to a cedar of Lebanon. Birds built nests in its branches, and animals were born beneath it. People from all nations lived in the shade of this strong tree. And the parable of cedars was also used to refer to the coming Messiah. Someday I, the Lord, will cut a tender twig from the top of a cedar tree, then plant it on the peak of Israel's tallest mountain, where it will grow <coughs> strong branches and produce large fruits. All kinds of birds will find shelter under the tree, and they will rest in the shade of its branches. Cedars were symbols of strength and power. And here's Jesus saying that the kingdom of God <coughs> isn't like the cedar tree. It's like the mustard plant. Hmm. Hmm. Jesus is there saying that, you know, the kingdom of God that you expected, that wonderful, powerful Messiah that was going to come and set everything right? No, it's not like that at all. The kingdom of God is quiet and small and even weak. Now, it's kind of interesting to note that mustard plants are annuals, not perennials. One season... They die off, never to be seen again. What does that say about the kingdom of God? This parable has a, par a parallel in Luke, where it's told with just a little different detail. Jesus said, what is God's kingdom like? What can I compare it with? It's like what happens when someone plants a mustard seed in a garden. The seed grows as big as a tree, and birds nest in its branches. Well, the difference here is that in Luke, the birds build nests in the mustard tree or the mustard bush. It makes it sound like such a sheltering place. There in the branches of the mustard tree, we can find safety and security. The only problem is that the branches of the mustard plant are very small and weak, and it really wouldn't take much of a windstorm to blow a nest out of a mustard plant. 
it's really not a very smart place to build a nest. What's Jesus saying there about the people who will inhabit the kingdom of God? Maybe Jesus was saying that those people are going to be kind of odd birds. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Huh. And then the par there's the parable of the lost sheep. Oh, you know the story. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law of Moses started grumbling. This man is friendly with sinners. He even eats with them. Then Jesus told them a story. If any of you has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will you do? Won't you leave the ninety-nine in the field and go look for the lost sheep until you find it? And when you find it, you'll be so glad that you'll put it on your shoulder and carry it home. Then you will call in your friends and neighbors and say, Let's celebrate! I found my lost sheep! Jesus said, in the same way, there is more happiness in heaven because of one sinner who turns to God than over 99 good people who don't mean to. Now, you know how we normally interpret this. Jesus is the good shepherd who will leave the flock behind to go look for the lost one and won't give up until it's found. <coughs> well, there's a couple of details there that we got to deal with before we can get to that. Beginning with shepherds <coughs> were kind of the loan sharks of their day. They were like used car dealers. <laughs> you shake hands with them, you count your fingers afterwards. <laughs> They were famous for hiding their sheep when the tax man came around so that they could avoid some taxes. <coughs> they were famous for um, things that they were known to have done with their sheep. Do fill that in any way you like. And they were always smelly. And they were always ritually unclean. And they were never allowed into the worship of God. Hmm. So now, you've got shepherds. Now, and let's also understand that this shepherd is incompetent. First of all, this shepherd has lost a sheep. And second of all, he leaves 99 behind you to look for the lost one. Which would you rather lose, one or 99? This shepherd is an embarrassment to the trade. And consider this. What kind of shepherd admits that they have lost a sheep? And then, and then, not only does he admit that he's lost the sheep, but then they have a party. And what do you suppose they ate at this party? <laughs> Who do you suppose they ate at this party? You think you know? Who was it? Uh, the sheep. The sheep. <laughs> wow. Hmm. But here's the best part. Jesus is talking with the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. And he begins this by saying, if any of you has a hundred sheep, he begins by asking his enemies to imagine that they are the shepherds. Can't you see the look on their face? Who are you calling a shepherd? Wait just a second, Jesus. Hmm. What an interesting parable. Is he calling them incompetent? What is he doing to them? He's using humor to insult them. Finally, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Oh, you know that one. We teach that every year at Bible school. I know that parable so well. We teach it to the children so that they'll know to be nice to one another. Hmm. A couple of details that we overlook. First of all, the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. 
It had been just a few years previous that the Samaritans had ridden a bunch of camels into the temple where they had defecated on the floor and ridden away. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other, and yet we have a Samaritan stopping to help a Jew. It's as if John Boehner stopped to help Barack Obama, who was broken down by his <laughs> These people really didn't like each other, and yet he does. And of course, there is the issue of the religious men. Isn't it interesting that there's actually two paragraphs about religious men? First was a scribe and a teacher of the law, and the other was a priest. Religious men who wouldn't stop. And, and you know, there's been a lot of folks that have tried to excuse these guys for not stopping, saying, well, you know, if they were on their way to Jerusalem to perform some kind of religious service, then I suppose it makes sense that they didn't stop to help this person and thereby become unclean. But notice that according to Jesus, these men were traveling down the road. From Jerusalem to Jericho, their work was done and they were headed home. They could have stopped. There is absolutely no missing the detail. Jesus thinks that the religious leaders of the day are hypocrites and frauds who, who use their position to make themselves rich and comfortable and who wouldn't even stop to help someone on the road. Hmm. You know, as a religious leader, it's that thought that keeps me awake at night. Now notice that the whole conversation begins in Matthew 10, verse 25, when we find that a young religious authority, lawyer, comes to Jesus to say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus and the lawyer agree that the answer to the question is found, first of all, in Deuteronomy 6, 6, known as the Shema to the Jews. They still say it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And then Leviticus 19, 18, which reads, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know what the lawyer is trying to do. Hey, Jesus. Tell me how wonderful I am. Tell me how perfect I am, how generous I am, how well I keep the law. I want you right here in front of everybody to tell folks that I am righteous. Hmm. It's in response that Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And so what is the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Everybody, including the people that you hate the most. Mm. There's that dig again at religious people. What do you suppose was Jesus' problem with these religious people? Well, I think part of it was that, that they should have been the ones who organized the parade on Palm Sunday. They should have been the one who said, hey, this Jesus, he comes from God. Let's listen to him. He's wise. He speaks for God. Let's listen to him. Instead of being the ones who most wanted to see him dead. But I think the, real, the thing that really irritated Jesus was that God was doing something in their midst. God was doing something in their world. And they were so religious that they missed it. Now let that thought run around in your mind a little bit. I think about it. So, 
Would Jesus like me? I don't know. Am I so religious that I miss what God's doing in the world? Are you? Now there's a question that will keep you awake at night. Because God is at work in the world. Despite all the violence and all the killings and all the separation and all the anxiety and suffering, God's at work in the world. Can we see it? Do we recognize it? Even if it's not in our midst, can we admit it? Hmm. Hmm. What a wonderful, wonderful parable. Would you pray with me? Oh God, you are doing things in the world. There are people whose hearts are breaking over what happens every day. God, there are people who use the resources they've got to make a difference. God, there are people who are helping things to change. Help us to believe in that. And to not let our religion get in the way of seeing what you're doing in the world. In the name of Christ.